preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good morning. I'm Deborah Nadell McGee, the director of the Charles Simon Center for Adult Life and Learning here at the 92nd Street Y, and I'd like to welcome you. A couple of notes before I introduce our guests. Upcoming this weekend on Saturday evening, we have an evening with Alan Dershowitz, who will be talking about his new book, Sexual McCarthyism, Clinton, Starr, and the Emerging Constitutional Crisis. On Wednesday, November 18th, we have Coretta Scott King, who will be here in the evening at 8 p.m. And as part of our Real Pieces film series, we have the pleasure of hosting Mike Nichols next week on November 12th. And now for our program. We have two wonderful guests with us this morning. One is Leonard Lopate and the other is Harold Evans. Leonard Lopate has a WNYC talk show, New York and Company, where he features guests who are already celebrities, some who are in the process of becoming celebrities, plus a fair sprinkling of the just plain interesting and eccentric. Politicians, poets, painters, novelists, filmmakers, actors, dancers, and anyone else capable of stimulating conversation is welcome, including more than a few Nobel and Pulitzer winners. This morning he will be having a discussion with Harold Evans Mr. Evans is, our, is the editorial director and vice chairman of the Daily News, U.S. News and World Report, and the Atlantic Monthly. Would you please join me in welcoming this morning's guests? Thank you. Thank you. By the way, one moment before we let them start. <coughs> we will be having questions on cards. so. You should all have cards at your places, and there will be a few moments where the hosts will come around and collect your cards. Thanks. Good morning. This is Harold Evans' new book. It's called The American Century, and inside this beautiful packaging are more than 900 photographs, political cartoons, and drawings, and a text of over 300,000 words. A review in this week's New Yorker praises it as a work of history which lives and breathes and wonderfully instructs. My only complaint is that, as a consequence, this 700-page book weighs something around two and a half tons. <laughs> um, Mr. Evans has already been introduced, and I'm sure you already know a lot about him anyway, otherwise why would you be here at this ungodly hour? So. Uh, you, Harry, um, probably find it easier to get up because you used to conduct a series of, um, of discussions when you were the president and publisher at Random House. Well, that was a late start because, uh, is, am I too close? That was a late start because that began about 8.30. While I was writing the American Century, I was getting up at 5 o'clock for a period of more years than I care to remember. And uh, it's amazing what you can do at 5 o'clock in the morning when nobody's watching. I'm sure. Um, <laughs> and as, as our president has uh, probably then let's, revealed let's, to us. Let, um, let, let's, let's stick to real well, history. We'll get to that later. Uh, at Random House, you edited and published Richard Nixon, Colin Powell, Henry Kissinger, Zbigniew uh, Brzezinski. Did that get you thinking about writing a history of your own? Well, meeting those people was certainly very instructive. You can learn a lot about Bismarck from Henry Kissinger if you're sitting ar arguing over a paragraph or two. Uh, but my real stimulation for getting interested in America was coming around this country in 1956 before most of these people here were born. Yes, I've, I've noticed. <laughs> But well, you begin the book actually not in 1900, but 11 years earlier. Why? Well, uh, the American Century, which is the title of the book, begins in 1889 because it's exactly 100 years when, since George Washington was inaugurated in the capital city, New York. And there were only 3 million Americans. So 100 years later, there's a ceremony at the bottom of Wall Street when 
the dainty new president steps ashore, Benjamin Harrison. That begins the second hundred years of America as a system of government. It's also the moment when the frontier has ended. The, the official census says there's no longer a frontier in America. Actually, they're still killing a few Indians here and there, uh, as I describe in the Battle of Into Wounded this Knee. century. And into this century, they're killing a few Indians. And then, of course, it's the, um, the first skyscrapers just gone up in New York. And also, for a book of 900 photographs, it's very relevant that uh, up in Rochester, those folks at Kodak have produced a metaphor for equality, a box brownie, so that everybody can take a photograph. So the American century, the second American century, ends in the middle of the Bush administration? Yes, and I don't think you can get a better ending. Forget the Bush administration for a moment. The, uh, uh, but I don't think you can get a better ending or a climax for the American century, Leonard, than 1989. If you'd thought, what ceremony could we put on to mark the, the climax of America's second hundred years? What, what could we devise? Well, for the 100th, 100th anniversary of the Statue of Liberty, they got a, you know, everybody in New York was an Elvis Presley imitator in rhinestones, and they had a thousand tap dancers and President Reagan. But three years later, nobody could have organized what happened, which was the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the liberation of Eastern Europe, which had taken 50 years of American generosity and courage with a number of American mistakes, admittedly. But nonetheless, what a fantastic climax that freedom was restored to vast areas of the civilized world uh, in, in that anniversary year. I'm sure that you're already bored with this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How does a man who has spent most of his life in the British newspaper and publishing worlds come to write such an ambitious book about American history? Um, arrogance, I suppose, would be a good answer. Uh, oh, no, actually, to tell the truth, well, I fell in love with the United States when I was here in the 50s. And I've had this incurable habit of filling every spare moment with reading. And I became very excited read, reading on my way across America in 1956. Dylan Thomas once said of the English, in the, uh, the English visitors like me and Alistair Cook and many others, he said, the English come and swill and guzzle their way across the United States while condemning it. Mm -hmm. And I never felt like that. I did swill and guzzle my way across the United States, though I lived on $10 a week in 1956 as a young student and reporter. But I fell in love with the country and I got excited about the proximity of the history. You could reach out on the one hand, as I did, and shake hands with the last surviving member of the tribe that, uh, uh, of Indians known as the Apaches, the Geronimo's tribe. On the other hand, the other week in Georgia, I found myself shaking hands with a hero in the book who just stepped alive onto the platform with me, and this was Alan Beale, the astronaut. And so there, in one outstretched hand, you have some of the excitement about American history, which is so close. The people in this room, no, not this room. There are people outside this room who can remember Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt. <laughs> you, you do find much to criticize in our story, but you're probably a lot more generous than an American-born historian would be in telling it. Well, because one of the things, Leonard, which strikes me, and it struck me in the 50s and still today, the, the freedoms the Americans enjoy, with many, many, you know, which not perfection and you'll never get it, is nonetheless singularly underappreciated. And certainly in the 50s, none of the newspaper men I met in the 50s realized the degree of freedom that they actually enjoyed. They knew the First Amendment protected them, and there were many struggles still to come, like the Pentagon Papers case. Well, the 50s brought McCarthy, and so exactly. people were more aware of the attacks on those freedoms. Exactly, but I was aware when I went back that they were able to withstand them because they had constitutional protections for their freedom. And at the end of the 50s, which were pretty horrible, and I found it very distasteful watching a lot of that, those inquisitions, nonetheless, at the end of that time, there were... Uh, uh, the judges on the federal bench, magazines like the New Yorker, uh, the ACLU, and, and many individuals, many individuals had the courage to stand up against the atmosphere of oppression, of the vendetta, the Inquisition. Incidentally, there were also many communists, which was correct. There were very communist uh, subversives in the United States. But nonetheless, the individuals were able to stand up because they had the protection of the rule of law, the bench, and they had the, behind that the Constitution. And in the end, that one. And America emerged from the 50s more able to 
not endure, or not even enjoy, go through the experiences of the 60s, which were revolutionary, and yet maintain its progress towards a better civilization. Well, if this is the American century, then do you think that American history has become world history to some degree? I do. In fact, what America does in the next century is going to determine what the fate of the planet. It's going to be a situation, in my estimation, where there'll be three large power groupings, one in Asia, which is probably Chinese, but we don't know yet, one certainly Europe, and then the United States and this hemisphere, and Africa, and, and the rest of it won't count, I'm afraid. Well, with the development of the Euro and all yeah. other aspects of globalization, uh, I suspect that the next century will not be the American century. It will be some other kind of world's uh, global I, century. I think you're right. It'll be, well, the, global cap the movement of global capital funds and, and the inf information flow around the world. But I think America will still be preeminent because we have in this country an amazing the rich and prolix uh, system of information exchange, which is not, there's, there's no comparison anywhere else in the world. And inf the flow of information uh, is, is consonant with power and also with prosperity. And secondly, we have in the United States a, um, an amazing amount of capital in all sorts of varied shapes and forms that can be tapped productively. Whereas you go to Japan, you've got the banks and then you've got the industry. You haven't got any of these varied forms that we have downtown here in Wall Street. There's an Aladdin's cave of financial instruments that can be used to increase prosperity. You've called your book uh, A History for Browsers, and anyone who goes through it will understand what you mean by it. But why try this approach? Because I've, uh, it's just I think a book of this side would certainly terrify me if I thought I had to begin at the beginning and go to the end before I dare speak to anybody. <clears throat> so I thought that the thing to do was to take specific episodes that you could dip into, and uh, like the Oppenheimer case, or like Al Capone, or Woodrow Wilson taking us into World War I, or Ronald Reagan, or the discrimination against blacks, and read that, and then if you want you can obviously begin. I'm not going to arrest anybody who doesn't begin at the beginning, mm -hmm. and um, and then read the essays. So I. So it's a it, modular approach. It's a, a modular way. approach. Every spread is self-contained. You can begin. You don't need to know a damn thing when you begin. The 1,200, 1,500 words. You can be excited or interested by the photograph. Then you can think, well, I really know enough now. And the more bigger ambition I have is that people will turn to the bibliography where we were going to list 5,400 books that I read in the course of doing this work and they can decide that they really want to know a lot more about Woodrow Wilson so they can read Arthur Link's 11 volumes or whatever it may be. And you've given, you say, equal weight to the personalities and the events. Yes, because I, I take the view that American history and, and British history for that matter turns a, a lot on individual personalities and, and, and I'm not a subscriber to the Tolstoy theory of history that's all due to great movements. And so m this book is full of stories about people, people, people. People you've never heard of who are very brave. People you've heard of who are sometimes very cowardly. In a way, it, it reminds me of a PBS documentary in a book form. I'm surprised that there isn't an accompanying Ken Burns film. Well, I I'm hope or somebody will. You know, some, the, I was too busy writing the book to try and exploit the dramatic potential, but I would imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, I did begin, when I began in 1984, I traipsed around to various foundations, and, I, and then I realized I was spending all my time talking about something I hadn't written. So I said, I'll write it, and then I've now got several producers want to make a dramatic series out of it. But this is history for the TV generation yes. to some degree. Yes. And, and when I lived in London, I was surprised by how much history the average school kid knew. Are you shocked by how little Americans of all ages know about their history? Well, this audience accepted, yeah, yes. Yeah, of course. The, uh, but they're young and they're uh, upwardly uh, mobile. Uh, the, and this, well, they're certainly mobile at an early hour of the morning. The, uh, I have to tell you, uh, I, having come back from, as you may tell from the less than total steely tone of my voice, I'm back from what's called a book tour which is the primitive form of torture. Uh, 
and uh, you know you, you can sleep in tomorrow. You only got to get up at four thirty a.m. and um, get a holiday in. A holiday in Des Moines. <laughs> yes, and please don't disturb the wrapping on the toilet seat. You know. <laughs> uh, that, that was, by the way, that was my first <coughs> big, big astonishment in the United States in 1950s. I didn't dare break that wrapping on the toilet. <laughs> You thought it was gift wrap for you for someone. I, th I thought somebody would spring out of the closet <laughs> and arrest me. And, uh, but um, I did have to be frank about it and say that I did speak to one nameless university where the postgraduate students knew so little I was absolutely terrified. I thought I'd written the wrong kind of book. <laughs> Well, most of the, uh, th this book is filled with huge photographs, and many of them tell the story more eloquently than any words could. Uh, maybe we can look at some of yes, these pictures. I must pay tribute to Gail Buckland, who uh, helped me in the 10 years search for these images, and also to my historical research to Kevin Baker. But Gail, in particular, went through amazing efforts. Let's just turn the lights down or whatever. Oh, this is me. For this says F, so that means forward, I think. Mm. Oh, just one. This is just an example of uh, uh, American gargantuanism. Nothing is big enough. <laughs> Wyoming, 1903. Beneath this peaceful scene, tremendous turmoil. The first state to give women the vote. Uh, this is uh. the building of the, the Woolworth building. For 30 years, it was the tallest building and then rapidly was overtaken. And this no. represents the power of money in the East. No, I'm upset that you've cropped this photograph because to the left we see the municipal building in the full photograph, yes. the building that I work in. Well, and that, we didn't <laughs> want to embarrass you in any... F oh, is that it? <laughs> because the, the area that I work in was unfinished in this yes, photograph. That's, that's right, you're right. Well, quite correct. I wanted to have William Jennings Bryan here this morning because I love his great speech. William Jennings Bryan runs through the American century in my book First is this brilliant speaker in 1896 who comes and makes the Cross of Gold speech, which is the beginning of the modern Democratic Party. He's a populist. And then it leads to them, burn down your cities and leave our farms and your cities will spring up again as if by magic. But destroy our farms and the grass will grow in the streets of every city in the country. You shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon, upon a cross of gold. This great cross of gold speech, which protested the money system that was depressing the poor and depressing farmers, is a, a really brilliant beginning to the American century. These are the people who died, the sailors who died on the battleship Maine which was the trigger for the Spanish-American War. And I point out in the American century that the Maine was blown up by the United States Navy, not by the Spaniards. And of course, it was, that was the cause, of the prime start of the Spanish-American War, which led to America becoming a colonial power. But it was all begun on a misreading of how the terrible explosion occurred. And yet the history books are still keep on saying that it was blown up by the Spaniards or it was a mystery, and it isn't a mystery. But that this, was Hearst, right? Or was that Rupert Murdoch this is, who did well, that? This is, this is it. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is a, a, the predatory Hearst who uh, ran the campaign to make war on Spain from here in New York in 1895. This uh, Spanish American War, Cuban rebel facing execution. Uh, this is the kind of uh, photograph, you've probably not seen this one, but it was the kind of photograph which stirred America to moral outrage about what was happening in Cuba. American heroes, every one of these men is an American hero. After the end of the Spanish-American War, they all volunteered, these men, to be bitten by a mosquito carrying the yellow fever virus, which is almost certain death. One doctor did die, another was uh, ruined, and Private John Kissinger up there on the third row at the left uh, was paralyzed for life and then got refused a pension by Congress. My One of my favorite pictures President Roosevelt Teddy saying goodbye to the American battle fleet which is sailing around the world. Congress wanted to stop him and he said well, I'm going to sail it to San Francisco as far as I can till the money runs out and so he did and then Congress relented and everybody was frightened it was going to be a terrible scenes in Japan but in fact the children sang the Star Spangled Banner in Japan but the military saw the importance of the Navy and this picture leads all the way to Kapil Harbor. 
This is a terrible picture from Indiana in 1930. Lynching was taking place in the north. I point out in the book that the second Ku Klux Klan revival was mainly in the Midwest and not in the south. And the Midwest was fearful not just of blacks but of Catholics and Jews and anybody who was slightly different from the Protestant uh, community. Uh, in the first year after World War I, uh, 71 blacks in uniform were lynched. And those people look like they're very happy. I the mean, people they're around, celebrating. You're right, Leonard. This is Ida B. Wells, a Memphis a journalist who actually conducted such a brave campaign in Memphis, she managed to get lynching stopped for a, a 20 years. Her newspaper was burned to the ground. She was an ardent uh, Baptist and is one of my American heroines. Great controversy in which the New York here was involved, Sacco and Vanzetti. This is the death mask of the fish peddler and the shoemaker. And I conclude in the American century that they were probably not guilty of the murder for which they were executed, but they were certainly violent and involved in bomb outrages. Genius camps out. This is a, a back to nature movement which overtook uh, Warren Harding. Uh, and uh, every year, he and Henry Ford and Harvey Firestone and Thomas Edison, the guy in the white, the bald-headed Thomas Edison who had given you the incandescent light, used to go out and, uh, into the woods. And this is the first occasion in which they've taken a cryptographer with them, the beginning of the hotline, because America is now involved in world affairs. Al Capone and baseball. I wanted just to draw your attention to what the reality of Al Capone. The man on the left in the straw hat is disturbed by the pop concert and is reaching for his revolver. Can you see the Capone bodyguard up there on the right? Uh, uh, somebody said to me, you shouldn't have included Al Capone in this book because he's not significant. I disagree. He was very, he represented the psoriasis of prohibition and what happened to the cities. I thought this was a photograph of Gabby Harnett. The, <laughs> it is uh, Gabby Harnett, yeah. you're right. I put, this is one of my favorite photographs. It, of the 900. This is a cloud. This is not a thunderstorm. This is topsoil, prime topsoil of the Midwest blowing over a town in Kansas. And the man walking into the left is going about his business as usual because this topsoil brew, blew over the Midwest for almost the, the whole decade. And it's also a metaphor for what's coming in the way of the Great Depression and, and fascism in Europe. And this picture you know by Dorothea Lange. She had five children with her. She was 32. She was trying to find work anywhere. And Dorothea Lange took it, had taken so many pictures for the FSA. She drove past the road where it said uh, 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 pea pickers needed. And then she, by instinct, turned back. And that's when she took this famous photograph. And in the book, I include a picture of Flo Thompson in later life. This is her with the silver hair with the three children who were in that picture. That picture became the icon of the Great Depression and of the Okies on the way west of California. And these children and their mother there lived under the bridge in Baker Bakersfield Bridge, which is mentioned in The Grapes of Wrath and is in the, uh, the movie with uh, Henry Fonda. This is an amazing photograph which Gail found showing the intensity of uh, Hitler and Goebbels. Uh, at the time, uh, when America was actually trying desperately hard every, not to notice what was going on in Europe. And the, the, the uh, young man at the front here and the girl at the back, her brother and sister, trying to leave Hamburg in May 1939 when the Jews are, know that the writing's on the wall. They have, they have a permit to land in Cuba and they don't get landed in Cuba. This is the voyage of the damned, and they're turned back from Miami, and Roosevelt won't help them uh, because of the pressure of the isolationists in America, uh, which is very intense at this stage. And uh, uh, Walter Carlin uh, and his sister went back, and the entire family went to Auschwitz, except Walter, who survived, and who now lives in Connecticut. And he wrote to me, the other day saying how bitter he still was about the, the death sentence on his sister when she was sent back. And give you a strength of the isolation in America, the, uh, uh, Colonel Lindbergh, whom I met, met in later life, was in fact a genuine American hero, but he was also an America first, uh, an anti-Semitic, 
and on this visit to Germany came back with an exaggerated notion of the power of the German Air Force. He was deceived because Goering flew the same planes round and round and round again, just changed the markings. So Lindbergh came back thinking the German Air Force was four or five times as big as it was. And in fact, as you know, and I speak as a former member of the Royal Air Force, they lost to Britain in the Battle of Britain. Mm -hmm. But Lindbergh regretted all his life, I think, the role he'd played in trying to uh, support the Germans. This, I love this picture as an example of uh, what you can, if you read a photograph properly, on the left you have what I call the British sandwich. You have Alexander and Monty sandwiching the genial Ike, and look at the faces on the right of the American generals standing apart. Bradley, for instance, they hated Montgomery, when with good reason. Montgomery was a brilliant general, but he was also a prig, an arrogant, vain individual who couldn't keep his mouth shut. And when he'd helped to rescue the American army at the Battle of the Bulge, he started bragging about it. And Montgomery of this picture says, uh, trouble ahead, just look at, the, uh, the, uh, look at Bradley's face, he says in a letter to a friend. Well, trouble's ahead for, uh, for Monty because Ike's about to sack him from leading the charge over the Rhine. But I put this picture in because I wanted to pay tribute to Eisenhower's diplomatic genius. And what America consumed in 90, a year in 1950. Uh, America in the 50s represented 6% of the world's population and consumed 33% of the world's resources, but made two-thirds of the world's manufactures. A climactic moment, this is a very brave individual of the kind I refer to called Mose Wright, an old black man who's pointing, this is the year I came to the United States, he's pointing to the killers of Emmett Till. And it's the first time a black man has dared to do that in the South, in Mississippi. And of course the killers are released, they're always acquitted in Mississippi. And this is the kind of atmosphere everybody may or may not remember these people. This is Price and Rainey, who are the killers of Schwerner, Andrew Goodman and James Cheney in the famous incident in Mississippi, which was partly told in Mississippi Burning, but which I go into in some detail. But these men actually were convicted, although they got minimal sentences. And just look at their faces, which ex tells you what a terrifying thing it must have been to be in Mississippi, of these young men in the 1964 trying to bring nothing more than the right to vote to blacks. That's all they were trying to do before they were murdered. I wanted to show you what we're up against in the Cold War, 1948. Look at the faces on the left, Mao and Chu, and look at the face on the right, which is our American representative is trying to outwit these guys. Can you imagine it? This is like playing poker in Las Vegas and you know, pretending you, you're the world champion. And you're up against. Uh, Pat Hurley there is responsible for much of the paranoia about the altar, who lost China. He used to begin every meeting with a Choctaw war yell. And he was, uh, uh, was completely outfoxed and became a passionate uh, devotee of Chiang Kai-shek and then invented the Yalta myth, which I explained. Mm. This is McCarthy and Asherson Leonard, which one of you, the picture you like, I understand. Well, I, I love the caption you have uh, that McCarthy was numb to the outrage that he evoked in others. And you see that here because um, I, uh, according to the caption in the book, he had offered to shake Dean Acheson's hand and look at Acheson, who's uh, just horrified that he's even stuck in this elevator well, with the, Joe McCarthy. I see, Joe McCarthy. <laughs> Joe McCarthy has called Acheson the greatest traitor in American history. And then five minutes later in the elevator, with missed surprise <coughs> when Acheson is kind of frozen. But the point about McCarthy and why I put the picture in, one of the McCarthy's points was he was absolutely numb to other people's sense of outrage. He, 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 he didn't know, you know, he was like coming up to somebody and insulting them, then expecting them to have a drink. And this is a very tragic photograph of the Rosenbergs, which had not been published before, who were executed uh, for a crime they did do. Well, it's been eyes, but they certainly did not deserve the sentence. And I describe in the book how <coughs> the judge said he went to the synagogue to pray for guidance before he executed them. He didn't. He went to the telephone booth and spoke to uh, Roy Cohn of McCarthy days saying, 
how do you think it will play in the New York Times if I execute a couple of Jews? And he was told it would play very well because it would prove that a Jewish judge could uh, rise above uh, religious uh, interest and put the country first. So the Rosenbergs were duly executed. It's a tragic story that actually you read it because they were undoubtedly guilty as spies. Watergate, I put this, captures some of the insouciant atmosphere of John Mitchell and his lawyers on the first acquittal. This was an acquittal concerning nothing more serious than bags of money changing hands, uh, and they got off. Uh, but that, uh, that was the beginning of the end of the Watergate, which incidentally, as a scandal, far surpassed anything of the recent controversies. And I think that will do. We could go on forever. There's a 900, but that's a few. Well, what's amazing to me is how many of these photographs <laughs> We see for the first time. Uh, I, you must have um, really gone cold all sorts of outtakes, things that, uh, that weren't famous yes. to find things that were different and that reveal all sorts of stuff that we're not really aware of. Well, Gail Buckland, and I don't know if she's in the audience today, but a remarkable woman, she's an American, I have to add, uh, but I met her when she was curator of the Royal Photographic Society in London, and so in 1984 I said, would you come and help me to find a few pictures? Well, 10 years and 30,000 photographs later, she'd been round the country and she'd gone to photographers. This is what I particularly was impressed with because I began myself by going to the Associated Press Library down at Rockefeller Center and looking through the negatives. And after six or seven days about this, I was fit to be sent away to a convalescent home because you're looking through hundreds of mm -hmm. negatives, trying to focus and is, this, is it slightly different? Is it better? Is it, is it new? Has it been seen before? But she did that for 10 years and she also went around the country and found photographers, found collections. And out of the 30,000, I chose the 900 in the book. Well, forgive me for asking this kind of question, but how much did you have to spend on photo rights? It must have been prohibitive. Well, we'll take a collection later. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, uh, about two hundred young and rich. Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars I spent on wow. photographs. I mean, the bills are still coming in. And I imagine that even with all of the seven hundred pages, there were things that you regretted having to leave out. Uh, you have left out mostly stuff on the arts, culture, and sports. This is pretty much a history of politics and economics, isn't it? It's a history of the power frame. There are allusions to literature and music and uh, boxing and, uh, and, and, and the other things, but I concentrated on the essential framework in which the civilized arts can take place, because unless that essential framework is there, nothing else matters. You should write a history of the culture in the 20th century. Well, well someday. Uh, I do see the influence of someone like John Dos Passos in your yes. approach here, and um, it has a literary feel in that sense. Uh, it, it really has been only since World War II that people have considered this the American century. When Henry Luce came up with the phrase, the American century, he was scolding Americans, wasn't yes. he? Yes, he said, look, you know, we're a very unhappy country. This is early 1940s. We're a very unhappy country. Don't we realize that if we seized our opportunity, we could lift up mankind, that we could spread the benefits of American civilization around the world? He said, why are we so gloomy? Why don't we seize this chance? He was, he was very, he didn't think America was gonna just defy the 20th, the, the title. One of the things about this period, if you ever read it, everybody's always very gloomy especially the English who come to the United States. I mean, if you go back to Rudyard Kipling and H.G. Uh, Wells, and they all think the country can't survive, it'll fall apart. Uh, but Luce was unusual because he was a gloomy American. Americans tend to be optimistic. So that was why it got a lot of attention. Well, it was 1941, and we were still an isolationist giant, right. weren't exactly we? Exactly right. He said, and he was saying, he said, look, all around, this is even 1941, he said, you know, wherever you go, our coke and our jeans are around the world popular from Zanzibar to Hamburg, but we don't seem to realize that the other mission that we have, which, and he, don't forget, he was born of Christian missionaries to China, so he had an evangelical streak in him. But actually, of course, if he were alive today, he would be absolutely enchanted by what happened. Well, because of what happened in the next 45 years. I, in a way, we call it the American century because of what happened after World War II. And uh, to defend the Brits, Jan Morris wrote a book called 1945, I think, or New York, yes. 1945, in which he says it was the greatest 
city in the world, and the United States at that moment was went through its golden age. Well, and I, many of us who yeah. lived at that time can remember back to then, and, and all the optimism, unless you were black or a member of some other minority group, it was terrific to be an American. It was. When I came in 1956, this, every taxi driver was Groucho Marx. He also knew where Grand Central Station was. <laughs> and um, when, I, when I went in, as I occasionally did, into a bar on 2nd Avenue, everybody at the bar was Damon Runyon and Hot, Hot Foot Joe. And if you go to the, went to the Plaza Hotel, as I was occasionally once able to do, having suddenly become rich by the gift of $20 from somebody, um, you could see Tom Buchanan and Daisy going through the lobby and Fred Astaire would come down the stairs at martini time. Of course, nowadays, nobody drinks martini. Does anybody here drink martinis still? When I came to the United States, I was offered martinis everywhere. It was, I was lucky if I could get across town without being arrested. It was so, <laughs> I was drunk almost all the time. <laughs> it's true, I tell you, I can't believe it. I remember giving a dinner party in San Francisco, with my first, and we got a big salmon, and somebody had another drink. And by the time we got to the salmon, we couldn't recognize it. We were all so... <laughs> Pixelated, but that's changed. It's a very sober society that gets up at six o'clock in the morning to talk books. According to, I had a big discussion with John Ashbury about the martini. He says it was not. It's not an American invention. We just adopted it. Uh, adapted it. It's from Europe somewhere, and the first forty-five, or the first, yeah, I guess forty-five years of this country's history, uh, in this century, uh, really are. <coughs> overshadowed by Europe, aren't they? I mean, when we think about culture, we're talking about f France, Britain, uh, <laughs> there were two great wars that were initiated by Germany, politically Marxist Leninism uh, in the Soviet Union was very attractive to people all over the world. We were this isolationist country that was churning out all these goods, but we were we really all that important? Oh, yes, but I mean, think, look, just take the 20s, which are regarded as the kind of dead land when, uh, you know, the famous story of Harold Stearns, who wrote The Death of American Civilization, he said, there's nothing happening in America. Everybody's fleeing to Europe, exactly as you said. Well, it was and jazz happening in America. Jazz was happening, but a lot was happening, but the point is that he was wrong. And all the intellectuals, the only one person who could find any uh, hope of civilization in America was a man writing about poetry. But Harold Stearns was later seen lying drunk across, across a Paris restaurant table and somebody said, there lies American civilization. <laughs> um, in fact, of course, that was the time when the Museum of Modern Art, uh, New Yorker magazine, uh, the Book of the Month Club, uh, music, uh, everything was exploding uh, culturally in Harlem and it was really a very exciting time, and people still tended to think of Europe as being dominant, but it wasn't. That was a complete uh, m m myth. And Anne Douglas has written a very good book about yes, that. Yes. And, uh, yes. You say at one point in this book, in fact, you, it, I think this pretty much permeates the book, but I'm, now I'm going to quote, um, that uh, America was more than merely the latest phase of a long succession of experiments in man's social history. It worked because the effort was inspired by the inner light of freedom, democracy delivered. So what you're saying here is that America emerges as the sole superpower to establish the triumph of freedom? Yes, I mean, I love England and, uh, and its cultural contributions, but if you look at in terms, it's strict in terms of freedom, the Bill of Rights and the actual freedoms here are greater. Of course, I'd also recognize, as, uh, don't paint me to be a kind of pangloss here, the limitations of, of uh, American freedom and the limitations of capitalism with still the largest gap between the rich and the poor. All these things have to be resolved, but, but they were going to be resolved within an atmosphere of free debate and uh, with a syst the political system, as we all know, is corrupted by money and by the need to tele television advertising. But my, I end up by being American about it. I end up by being optimistic, because I think that once, once the essential freedoms to argue, to speak, to travel, and to be your own person are in, intact and are protected, you can get progress and improvement. 
but you're never going to get to a, a, a kind of utopia because that's not possible. Well, according to Thomas Paine, justice and equality are in conflict with freedom. And then we have Eric Foner recently writing a book about freedom, and he says uh, that freedom for some usually means oppression for others. And so part yes. of the problem is balancing the, yes. the what the libertarians might want uh. with the other things that... I guess the welfare staters might want. Exactly. Well, I think the, uh, America and, and this similar kind of problem exists in England. How can you give economic freedom for enterprise and so on and create prosperity without the state time exploiting and oppressing others? Or how can you provide welfare benefits without overtaxing the entrepreneurial providers of prosperity? And the tension between those two is at the heart of the current democratic democratic debate and sometimes the balance goes too far i think in the 80s it went too far although as i say in the book the 80s were not in fact a period in which america really went to the right because opinion public opinion in america is very often undervalued the polls are careful reading on there's a new book by wolf which i've quoted alan wolf throughout the 80s this is astonishing and even in the in the 1994 clinton election you could find in the polls Americans willing, willing to be taxed, not for their own benefits, but for the benefit of uh, the underclass in the cities. It's absolutely astonishing. And, and you, never, you don't read it because people generalize all the time. They say, oh, Americans do this. They don't. If you look at the evidence, it's not there. Well, the polls indicate that, but the arc of history has been quite different. We, in the 30s, we saw the creation of the welfare state. Really, as you say in this book, it saved this country. Uh, it reached its peak with Lyndon Johnson's administration and has been somewhat dismantled ever since by every president since Reagan, including Bill Clinton with the welfare bill. So on the one hand, Americans are saying in the polls one thing, but they seem to be voting differently. Well, and taxes do become a big issue in well, most elections. And when they vote, that is, you know, because the beginning of this 1889, only 26% of the population can vote People under 21 can't vote, women can't vote, and blacks can't vote. And basically. now only 26 percent vote. And now even, even only 26 percent vote in 1889. And in the, in the 1890 presidential election, you had 76, 77 percent of the 26 percent voted. Mind you, I think it's very important that people vote. And the last picture in the book is of a, a lone woman at a polling booth, which comes from my image of being in Chicago in 1956 and seeing a lone woman stand up to a really violent democratic precinct captain trying to dictate how people voted. But democracy takes place more than at voting times. It takes place in dialogue, continual dialogue and changes, and the public opinion is adjusted. So I do get depressed about the low turnouts, but it's not the only thing which matters. Well, on the one hand, we see this direct line toward more and more freedom. Uh, we see women given the vote, finally, and then even much too late later, we, get, we see blacks getting the vote as well. I mean, they had it legally for a while, but um, obviously yep. it took the Civil Rights Act of 1968 to actually get it. Uh, and, and we see that kind of progress. On the other hand, economically, we seem to be going back to where we were at the beginning of the century, that we no longer, we want to end big government these days. Well, take care, as I say, looking at, <clears throat> everybody wants to end it until it becomes something which affects them, because everybody also believes in education, so the argument which is going on now, of course, as many people in the audience will know, is between how far you can trust the states to, to uh, push education and how far you can push the central government, how much waste there is in the, in the educational system. It's the only possibility of salvation for the continued underclass in this country, especially if you now realize that all the manufacturing jobs have gone. The whole future now is on education, information, and technology. And, and so you need to improve the educational effort. We, we're also a country that at times is driven by idealism, and that's why we had prohibition. I love the prohibition. Everybody in this room, if, we, if I now rushed out of there and shouted, police, and you all had a drink in front of you, in Hollywood you'd all rush out. You know the films, mm -hmm. you all rush out. In fact, it's a, it's a kind of myth because nobody was ever arrested for drinking. 
Nobody was arrested for drinking in Prohibition. They were arrested for selling it, and you might get caught in a police swoop and have to testify that you actually drank it, but you were safe to say you drank it because the federal law wasn't directed against drinkers, but only the makers of the drink who occasionally blinded people, of course. And not just say one small thing about Prohibition, since I know this is a room full of uh, uh, non-drinkers. At the end of the, uh, the Prohibition period, it was really something which came from women, the women against the saloon keepers. Men did get uh, lose their wages on the way from the workplace. Uh, there was more wife beating and violence, and the prohibition period, the noble experiment, was a disastrous failure in giving rise to people like Capone, but a success in let tending to more sober habits and in the protection of families, and that's also shown in the statistics. Well, <coughs> another interesting thing is that we're seeing more people um, attending religious uh, services. Um, in the last century, there were fewer churchgoers. Yes. Uh, we uh, probably have more people going to synagogues and churches and mosques in this yes. country today than ever before. Yes, percentage. but you've also, that's a, not true, that's a plus provided, provided they pray for the right things. But you have to also bear in mind... I pray for Newt Gingrich every uh, night. Well, this is <laughs> one, of the pro one of the problems now is that really for the first time in, uh, you've got... Uh, religion being exploited politically much more than it ever has been. So the, 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 the idea that uh, Caesar and Christ should be separate has now been lost because you have the Christian right, you have the coalition, the Christian coalition getting into politics, uh, mainly with the Republican, always with the Republican Party. And I think that's a setback to religion in the United States. To have religious groups identified with a particular political party is a big mistake. Getting back to the idea of freedom, which permeates this book, some leftist historians like Howard Zinn say that the hypocrisy of America's call to freedom can be seen in our foreign policy, and uh, we see that throughout the history of this century in Cuba and the Philippines, the Philippines especially, where people thought that we were liberating them, and, and instead we just occupied the Philippines until the end of World War II. Uh, then we have Latin American policy throughout the century, Iran, Vietnam. Uh, are, we, are we confused about what freedom means or are we self-righteous about it and think that we're the only people who know what it is and we can bring it to the rest of the world? Well, that kind of evangelical fervor was more common to the British and the British Empire, incidentally, which did nonetheless leave a sediment of civilization because it established the rule of law, take India, India's run today on institutions that the British left and the Philippines today is run on institutions the Americans left, rule of law. And it was an occupation power, and I trace the history of this in the book, but it was, it was kind of benevolent. But uh, Howard Zinn and others are right to be critical of the intervention in uh, the overthrow of the government in Iran, Mossadegh, which led finally to the Iranian hostage crisis. And you pay a price for these intrusions. And as I've traced in the book, uh, the doctrine of containment uh, got misunderstood and particularly in Latin America where we were pre prepared to support right-wing dictatorships which were appalling examples of uh, human rights abuses, Guatemala, Salvador and so on because we were more fearful of communism. Now we don't have that anxiety or that excuse, so there's no excuse now for sustaining any regime which denies human rights. And the history of the CIA, as I've shown, I mean, uh, is very mixed and certainly not particularly good in relation to overthrowing. And it was a period in the year when they were very much acting against the Constitution, the crown jewels, as I've explained in the book. And, and so Chile, we just recently had Pinochet, America's role in Chile was not good. It was just not good at all because we knew that Allende was going to be attacked and murdered and we didn't tell him even though he was the constitutional government, and even though he was not a particularly good leader of Chile because he oscillated between extreme left and the communists and didn't actually run the country very well. Nonetheless, for us to conspire to overthrow him, which we did, and then to acquiesce in his murder was not a great day in American history. There are some conservative historians like Francis Fukuyama 
who say that after the fall of the Soviet Union, history ended. Well, that is a wonderful conceit, but that's all it is, uh, because it does suggest that we've arrived at some kind of millennium. We will never, ever get there because there's going to be constant struggle. We know he wrote that when it seemed that the Soviet Union was about to become a kind of modern California. Well, it's not happened. Uh, and, and, and capitalism... It's become you know, a modern Siberia. A modern Siberia. I mean, the Russians have went... The Russians, ate, uh, Russians in 1989, 1998, I keep... are about this, where the United States was in 1889, an unrestrained capitalism, and, and they're wondering how they can modify it and how they can, uh, you know, spread the benefits of uh, material wealth around and they haven't had any of the experiences that we've had. They haven't had the, they don't have the information system, they don't have the education system, etc, etc. But one thing they do have, and one thing where I think almost there's some truth in this, uh, in my rejection of this, this statement that, that history is over, history is never over and a country can only be itself and can only know its identity when it knows its past, because if it doesn't know its past, it can never find its future. I wonder what you think about uh, the state of American journalism as a person who has worked in journalism most of your life. How would you compare your former boss, Rupert Murdoch, and what he has brought to American journalism to what Hearst and Pulitzer were doing at the start of the century? Do you see any similarities? Oh, I think they're very similar. I think that the, uh, the virus survives. But we, we had this illusion, at least for a time, that things had improved, American journalism had, had the, the ideal of objectivity, whatever that means, but still, objectivity, uh, and then in time, uh, we didn't play favorites, we stopped playing favorites, and now we have this hounds at the heels approach of journalism, and then we have people like Murdoch running editorials on the front page, supporting their, their candidates, skewing the news so that certain people can win and others uh, I don't mind we hope, he mind. hopes will lose. Yeah, I don't mind him writing the editorial on the front page because that's a kind of extension of the editorial page and that's what they were going to say there. So the geographical placing of that doesn't bother me. What bothers me is the, is the distortion of news on the news pages or wherever it may be. Cheerful determination never to correct error. Mm -hmm. Was that a problem you had when you worked for him? Uh, the problems I had are in a wonderful book called Good Times, Bad Times, and the bad times are described. Before we get to these questions, I just want to ask you, um, because you did, had a whole bunch of slides of presidents, which we're not going to show. Well, we could, but, but we've not got the time, I don't think. But um, do you want to talk about some of the presidents yeah, and well, what they've represented? And are you all talked out about uh, this current one in Monica Lewinsky, no, or do you have uh, ideas to add to that? Well, I, I, we had a little seminar in New York recently, and as soon as the word Monica Lewinsky was mentioned, the audience groaned, and we never asked the question. Uh, the truth, of course, of, is that uh, by historical standards, it's not exceptional. Uh, if you just take a president like... Uh, the one I like most in American history is Warren Harding. Warren Harding had a 15-year affair with a woman called Carrie Phillips, who was the best the wife of his best friend, but his best friend was very boring and Carrie Phillips found Warren Harding handsome and enchanting. And then she went to Germany in 1914 and she came back in 1917 to resume the affair and to say to Warren Harding that unless he voted against going to war with Germany when Woodrow Wilson put it to the vote in Congress, she would expose the whole affair. So what did Warren Harding do? Well, he voted for Wilson's uh, war declaration, but he was helped by the fact that the Republican Party was very adroit. They put her on a very slow boat to Japan <laughs> and gave her $20,000, and she was never heard of again. <laughs> so what are you suggesting here about Monica there? <laughs> now that, um, that the ocean liners are pretty much dead, know, this is one of the and the QE2 probably yeah. can... Uh, this, is, can I remember, this is one of the problems of a fast-moving civilization, <laughs> yeah. But there are many examples. The, 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 um, just you were talking about the press a moment ago, it's quite remarkable when you think about how the... Not, let's get off sex for a minute, uh, which is hard to do, I know, in this country, but, and this moment in time. Uh, 
And I thought the polls showed that people wanted to get off sex and stuff. They want they, to get off it and they want to get on it. At the same well, yeah, time. but in less, less private and public capacities. The, um, if you think of Franklin Roosevelt, who was crippled and who couldn't stand up, and nobody in this country realized at the time that he couldn't walk unaided. And the, all the photographers around Roosevelt had an unwritten code. They would not photograph him in difficult positions, which demonstrated he was a cripple. So the leader of the free world was always presented as erect. And any photographer who took a picture, one or two did, they didn't get it published, and he was out, you know, sent to Coventry, outlawed by his fellow colleagues. So a great respect for the presidency as an institution and a great respect for privacy as a personal. And yet Roosevelt, don't forget Roosevelt when he died, the lady with him was not Eleanor Roosevelt, but Lucy Rutherford, Lucy Mercer. And uh, that when Eleanor arrived, a very cruel cousin said, you know, that woman was here when he died. Terrible. Yep. Well, I once asked Ben Bradley what he would have done if he had known that Kennedy was dallying with all these women. It's hard for me to believe he didn't. But he, he didn't know. He didn't. No, I, I spoke to Bradley about it quite recently. He, he says he know. thinks he would have he would have put it in the paper, but I, I'm not sure. I'm I think the tone sure in the country was I don't different. I not think he would have put it in the paper. I talked to Ben only a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he did not know. He, got, he, he finally discovered, mm -hmm. but he didn't know the, the extent of uh, the Olympic nature of the achievements in that area. <laughs> And I'm not sure whether he was envious or... Um, um, let's ask some of these questions here. This is from this very young group. What about Kenneth Starr? Would you call him the Grand Inquisitor vis-a-vis -vis McCarthyism? Yeah, I think that... Um, McCarthy did... There were spies in McCarthy's, but he never uncovered any, and he used all sorts of violent lies and methods. And you have a wonderful photograph, by the way, of him with Roy Cohn and, I do. and yeah. David Shine, was it? Yes. It's just the three of them look rodent-like in that photograph. They do. They, oh. do. <clears throat> they do. I have a photograph of Roy Cohn at the time and a photograph of him. I do a technique called flash forward, so you see... Uh, Roy Cohn in 1954, then you see him in 1984, and it's an it's the picture of Dorian Gray. It's just absolutely extraordinary. Plastic Photograph surgery. By, it was plastic surgery, by the way. He looks ravaged. The whole of his life has come back on his face. And, um, well, Ken Starr Reverse. Uh, turned a judicial inquiry into a political vendetta. No question about it. Because if you look at the, uh, the, the report which went to Congress, you have to ask yourself, how relevant is it what Monica Lewinsky said about the state of Mr. Clinton's marriage? Completely irrelevant. And half the stuff in the report is completely irrelevant to the actual specific charge about perjury and about sexual relationship. It's completely irrelevant. And yet it's in there because there's a sense of political vendetta Going on, and I think the public, again, you see, it's rather remarkable. In my view, and this is only a personal opinion, the, um, I mean, I have no historical evidence, really, but the, the public perception of, of Starr, and the, I think, is clearer than, than if you look at the polls, and I think that's vindicated. A lot of people were outraged that each sex act was repeated in exactly. the report three times. Well, see, well, but the Democrats were afraid of it, and um, only at the end of the election did some yeah. actually go after Starr as a, an election point. And I, I suspect that if the Democrats had made a bigger case of it, some might have lost, but others might have done a lot better. Well, they were in a terrible funk about it. And of course, they had a right to be angry because they felt they'd be misled. Mm -hmm. Here's one that says, uh, do you plan to revise the book to include the impeachment story, which is certainly an important event in this century? God willing, if I live long enough. And, and you know, I'd always, when I, the, the thing is, you have to remember, when I was writing this book, I had a whole two pages on the 1987 stock market crash, which is not in the book now, because it's lost its perspective. And, uh, and I think it, I've ended the book in 1989. I've got a photograph of Kenneth Starr surrounded by media, and I make some references to it. But when I revise it, when it will be, I, I will obviously have to take account of that. But remember what Chu and Lai said when he was asked what he thought 
with the effects of the French Revolution in 1789, and he said it's too early to tell. <laughs> and uh, and I sometimes <coughs> I feel like that now, but I think that this Lewinsky affair will have a different perspective in three or four years' time, especially uh, we have to see what happens to the presidency in the next two years, and the Republican Party is in total disarray now. My ev everybody's estimate is that the impeachment proceedings, which is I, my belief, and I think I was one of 400 historians who signed an advertisement to this effect, that to lower the bar for impeachment in the way in which it's been attempted would be a completely unconstitutional and dangerous thing for the United States to do, because it would elevate the power of the Senate, which would be the final court, and lead to a weakening of any chief executive, because every chief executive in the future, there's going to be some political squall. Just think, for instance, of uh, Iran-Contra, about which there was no question everyone was going to impeach. But here we had an abuse of public power, we had lying, we had deceit of Congress. And I think at the end of the day, it was right not to impeach Reagan, but the grounds are very strong. That's part of the political turmoil. And to take the American Constitution and intrude into it an inquisitorial element and to give the Senate the power to get rid of a chief executive, I think would be to transform the Constitution very dangerously. We've run out of time, but I have to ask this one other question. How did you organize your research? Barbara Tuckman used shoe boxes. I was almost, uh, <clears throat> I used a very tolerant wife because I took over more rooms in the house than you could possibly imagine and uh, kept, managed to keep the door shut. The, um, the computer helps a lot. I mean, she, I, I, I have great admiration for Barbara Tuckman as a historian, and, but I, what I did was make notes on all the books I read and then brought up the notes on the computer. We should also point out that Harold Evans became an American citizen a few years ago, as are his children. Thank Although you. Tina Brown is still a British citizen. But that's another matter. I want to thank you so much, all of you, for coming here. I want to thank Harold Evans, thank Emily Hoffman, the people here at the Y. It's been a lot of fun, and you'll be signing books now, won't you? Yes, I will. Be happy to do that. Thank you. Thank our partners, Barnes and Noble, for supporting our efforts in this new series of Books and Breakfast. There will be books available on your way out for purchase and you can have them signed by Mr. Evans. Thank, Thank you for you coming. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.